All right, I decided to add in a section. So we're going to start chapter two a little bit, uh, a little bit different. We're going to add some vocabulary terms to chapter two because we're going to talk a lot about the different divisions, division one, division two, division three, NAIA and NJCAA. We have all of those different sections that we're going to talk about. But we're going to use words like NLI and green shirt and red shirt and uh, contact period and dead period. As we talk about these different types of things, I want you to know what they are. So I would recommend that you take out a sheet of paper and you write down the definitions of these words so that when we go over them later, I'm not going to take my time to sit there and define them later. I'm going to assume that you already know what they are. So for me to assume that you already know what they are, I'd like for you to write them down now. We're going to first talk about the four types of periods that there are in a Division I coach's calendar. Division II, Division III, NAIA, and NJCAA don't necessarily have any recruiting calendars. Um, Division II does. They do have a dead period during signing week or a couple of the first couple of days of signing, the first signing period. So that signing period is going to be in November. And the signing periods are going to be in February. It, their dates range a little bit, so you might want to check with your year of your graduating class to see the exact dates. But signing period is a one-week period. Most people do it on that very first day, and they sign. Uh, but anyway, let's talk about the different types of periods that we have during our um, year long for, I'm going to tell you what those dates are and whenever I talk about Division I. But you hear a lot, dead period, quiet period, contact period, and evaluation period. What do they mean? I'm glad you asked. Let's go ahead and go over it. So first off, we're going to talk about a dead period. Okay, A dead period in Division I means that the coach cannot have face-to-face -face contact with you at all. You can't talk to him on his campus. He can't come to your campus. He can't come to your practice. He can call you on the phone and he can email you. So it doesn't mean that you can't talk to the coach. It just means that you can't talk face to face. He can't visually see you unless he bumps into you in the grocery store or something. He can't visually see you. Okay? So that is a dead period. Now, the next one that takes a step up from dead period is quiet period. Okay? In a quiet period, if you'd like to go to the school's campus, you can go and talk to the coach. Okay, so you can go on the campus and talk to the coach. You can have face-to-face -face contact on the campus, but not off campus. The coach can't come to a clinic and watch you off campus. The coach can't go and watch you at a qualifier. The coach can't watch you during high school or during your games. A quiet period, basically, and the coach can call you and can email you and can see you if you come to their campus, but he can't go off campus to see you. So that's what a quiet period is all about. Okay. Next is a evaluation period. In an evaluation period, the coach can come and see you, but he can't have face-to-face -face contact with you. He can't talk to you at all, or she can't talk to you at all. So what we have here is we have a time where they can go and watch you play, but they can't say, hey, Susie, come talk to me after the game. Let's go ahead and go over what you went over. They can't have face-to-face -face contact. Now, if you call them on the phone, you can talk to them. They can email you, okay? But during an evaluation period, there is no face-to-face -face contact between you and the coach. Only time that you can contact them is over a direct message on social media, by email, or by phone, or by text. Okay, got it? And then contact period. When it's during the contact period, whew, there are no rules. You can, there are some rules on the amount of time that a coach can talk to you and how many times they can talk to you. But during a contact period, you are allowed to talk to the coach. He is allowed to talk to you or she is allowed to talk to you. And they can email you, call you. You can go on campus. You can go off campus. So those are the different types of period. Again, dead period, no contact. You can call on the phone, text, or email. Quiet period. No contact off campus, but you can go on campus. Evaluation period, no face-to-face -face contact, but they can see you and they can take a look at you and watch you and evaluate you. And then in a contact period, they're allowed to talk to you. Okay, hopefully that helps you out a little bit. Now, what is a contact? 
If a coach has contact with you, it's basically anything more than, hey, how you doing, Susie? Hey, good luck today, Susie. One sentence, just a hey, hi, hi, how are you? That's what a contact is. An evaluation is any time that a coach watches you compete. Now, certain co coaching staffs only have a certain amount of evaluations they're allowed to do a year. So they might tell you, hey, our evaluation dates are done. In Division One, it's a different number. Division Two, I don't think they have a number. Division Three, we don't have a number. NAIA, NJCA don't have any rules, okay? So an evaluation is any time that a coach watches you compete. Now, financial aid is any money that you use to go to college. Could be a loan, could be an outside scholarship, could be a scholarship from the school. But financial aid basically is money you use to go to school. That's what financial aid is, okay? A full-time student. Full-time in most schools, if not all schools, is 12 hours. You have to be enrolled in 12 hours, which usually means four classes a semester, okay? If you're on the quarter system, it's a little bit different. You can take a look at what the requirements are for your school that you're looking at, but basically it means 12 hours. Sometimes if you're in the last semester of your senior year, you don't have to have all the way up to 12 hours. If you're a graduate student, you might not have to have 12 hours, but for the normal athlete and the normal student, it is 12 hours per semester. You can't go below that or you lose your financial aid and you become ineligible. You have to be a full-time student to play sports, okay? The next one, we're gonna talk about it extensively in, chap in unit four, chapter one and chapter two, but it's an official visit and an unofficial visit. Let's talk about unofficial visit first. An unofficial visit is you going to a school and looking around. Is you going on the campus of the school, driving to a school or flying to a school to take a look around. Now. In an unofficial visit, you are paying for everything. And guess what? You're allowed to have as many as you want unofficial visits at every school. You can have 100 at each school in the nation. It's legal, but that's a lot of money. Now, an official visit is where you go to a school. Again, there's a whole chapter about official visits. Official visits cannot start, there's a brand new rule that just came out. Official visits cannot start until August 1st before your junior year. So anytime you hear in this course, an official visit starts on June 15th, that is wrong. An official visit starts on August 1st before your junior year. And an official visit, it can last 48 hours and it's basically the school is paying for your travel most of the time. They're paying for the hotel for your parents most of the time. They're paying for all of your food on campus all of the time. And they're paying up to, I think, $40 a day the NCAA allows for your entertainment to take you out to a movie, to take you to get ice cream or a snow cone, uh, to whatever it might be that you have to do afterwards. So that's what an official visit is. The school pays on an official visit and then a you would pay for everything on an unofficial visit. Division one and division two start their official visits on August 1st before your junior year. No matter what else you hear me say during this course, it's August 1st before your junior year. Division three, it starts on January 1st of your junior year. Okay, so they are five months apart from each other. You start your division one, division two visits first, and then you go to your division three visits starting in June. I would recommend to get all your division one, division two visits in, in your junior year fall. And then if you haven't found your school, start to look at some division three schools, okay? All right, next up is a season of competition. Anytime that you play any amount of games, it's counted as a season of competition. You're allowed to have four seasons of competition. Now, this is only in your traditional segment, which means your fall segment. If you play in the spring, it doesn't count as a season of competition. I know in a lot of schools, in most divisions, it might even be in the NAI, but take a look at it. I'm pretty sure in the, all of the NCAA, you do not use a season of competition in the spring, but if you play any games in the fall, you use a season of competition. Now, there's a thing called a medical red shirt. If you play less than 33% of the games of a season, and it's in the first half of the season that you play in, you get a medical red shirt, which means that you get your season of competition back and you still have four other seasons, okay? But if you play any matches in the second half of your season, 
or if you play more than 33% of your games. So if you play 40% of your games in the first half of the season, you still use this season of competition. That is kind of clear as mud, but when we talk about seasons of competitions, you're only allowed to play four years. Now, you're allowed to play four years over five total years. They have what they call a five-year clock. As soon as you start full-time status in school, you have five years to, to play volleyball, okay? We call it a 10 semester rule at those schools that take semesters. Quarters, you can go and find out what that is at your quarter school. But in semesters, you have 10 semesters to play four years, okay? So you can take a year off, but you can't take more than a year off. You have a five year clock. You have to play four years within five years, okay? So that's what we call a 10 semester rule or the five year clock. It just basically tells you as soon as you start full-time status somewhere, that's when we start counting your five years. You have to play four years, you only get one year off after you start. Now you've heard this, you've heard this thought process of walk-on, okay? You've heard a recruited walk-on, an unrecruited walk-on, and a preferred walk-on. First off, let's decide what a walk-on is. A walk-on is somebody that is not getting any, any athletic aid. Got it? No athletic aid. You can get academic aid. You can get a full scholarship academically, but you are not getting any athletic-related aid. That means you're a walk-on, okay? Now, if the school pays for an official visit or if a coach comes and watches you play face-to-face, -face, you are a recruited athlete. If they evaluate you, you are a recruited athlete. If they don't pay for an official visit, they don't visit you, there's a lot of things that have to go where you're an unrecruited athlete. But unrecruited and recruited walk-ons are, are basically people that do not get any athletic aid. Now, a coach might come to you and say, you're a preferred walk-on. A preferred walk-on says, I really like you, Susie, but I don't have any scholar athletic scholarship for you now. I might have scholarship for you in the spring or in your second year, or maybe we have a two for two deal where you pay for two and then I'll pay for two or a three for one, there are a lot of different things, but when they say preferred walk-on, that means they're gonna to try to get you a scholarship if one is available. You've seen all those videos of coaches giving walk-on scholarships. This is what they're talking about. This is a preferred walk-on. If a scholarship becomes available, you are on my preferred walk-on list, I'm gonna give that scholarship to you, okay? That's what we call a preferred walk-on. Now, we talk about shirts. You've heard about red shirt. You might have heard about gray shirt or blue shirt or green shirt. I always think of Dr. Seuss, you know, red fish, blue fish, green fish, blue fish, green eggs and ham, all this other stuff. It just blows my mind when I think about shirts. But I want to talk to you a little bit. Now, red shirt is the most common type of shirt that they're going to have. A red shirt basically says you're going to sit out a year and learn. Now, you can get paid that year. In that red shirt year, you can get paid. It might be your second year. You might come on and the coach needs an outside hitter right now. So you're going to come in and play outside. And then the next year, they have 50 outside hitters. So he's going to take a year and develop you into a right side hitter or into a middle hitter or into a DS. But there might be four DSs that year. You're not good enough. They have another outside that's coming in that's better than you. So they're going to red shirt you your second year. It usually still means that you're going to keep your scholarship, but sometimes it means you're not going to have your scholarship. But it's one of your five years in your five-year clock. It could be your first year, second year, third year, or fourth year. It won't be your fifth year. You won't be redshirted then because you've already used your four years of season of eligibility. Okay? So a red shirt just means you're going to sit out a year. Most of the time, you are still going to get money for it, but you're a red shirt. A gray shirt means... Um, that a coach has too many players and not enough money. This happens a lot with college coaches and college football, okay? They recruit 35 people and they only have 20 scholarships. They recruit 35 people and say, I'm gonna give you a gray shirt. That means if I have a scholarship and a spot on the team, you're gonna come. But as a gray shirt, I might not have a spot for you. A lot of times it's because I have a five-star athlete that I'm waiting on their decision. They're not making their decision until signing day, so I'm waiting. If they don't sign, guess what? That's more money for you. But if they sign, done, 
you're gonna have to wait a year and wait until like, you're gonna have to become a preferred walk-on or something like that. It's where a coach has too many offers out and not enough scholarships to fill them. It happens sometimes, it doesn't happen very often, but some schools do use the gray shirt. If somebody says, I'm offering you a gray shirt option, that basically means they're recruiting you, but they have other people at your position that they might want a little bit more than you if they're honest, and they might take your money. And then the last is a green shirt. Green shirt is awesome, okay? Green shirt basically means, and it's very, it's very helpful, it's especially used in fall sports, basically means that you're gonna graduate at, in January of your senior year of high school. And then you're gonna go to the school during that spring semester after your senior year. Basically, your graduation is until May, but you're gonna go play college volleyball that spring. And you're gonna get money for it. So if they, want, they say they want you to take a green shirt, that means you get to go play spring volleyball, and then you get to start your freshman year and you've already had a semester of college before you start your freshman year of fall volleyball. So a green shirt is just basically they're bringing you a little bit early. Happens a lot in football, and it's where students graduate early to go play volleyball, okay? All right, a couple other things I wanna talk about, the eligibility center. In this next chapter, we're gonna talk a lot about eligibility center and what you need to do to get ready for division one, okay? The eligibility center, is a place that you go in and you put in all of your test scores, all of your transcripts, you send it to the eligibility center. You have to pay for it in division one and division two, not in division three. You do have to pay for it, play in AI and in AI. I'm not sure about junior college. I don't think you have to, but it basically gets you eligible. Okay. It tells the colleges that are recruiting you green light. This person is eligible to play division one volleyball. Green light, this person is eligible to play Division II volleyball. Division III volleyball and eligibility is based on each school's academic requirements. So you would only be eligible by this school, but getting all of your information into the eligibility center saves a lot of time for a compliance officer. So it's basically helpful to all the coaches where they can say, okay, this person's eligible, now I can offer them. So the eligibility center is something that you probably want to start as a junior, starting to turn in your transcripts and your test scores to the eligibility center, pay for your eligibility number, and then giving your eligibility number to the coaches, they can type it into the eligibility center to see that you're eligible. So the NCAA eligibility center is what they're talking about. It's an easy way for you to get eligible, and it's an easy way for coaches to say, okay, she's eligible, I can recruit her, and, and she can play for me. If you're not eligible, they're not going to offer you a scholarship most of the time. Okay. The other two things are basically your signing documents. We have a thing called the NLI or the National Letter of Intent. This is a binding agreement between you and the school that you're signing it with that you are going to play there at least your first semester. Okay. As soon as you sign it and as soon as you fax or email it to the coach, you have to play at that school for the first semester, okay? We're gonna talk about it later. You're gonna play there the whole time, okay? You're going there for four years. If you commit to a school, there's no such word as decommit. We'll talk about it later. But a national letter of intent says, I'm coming to your school, coach. You don't need to recruit anybody else. I promise you I'm coming to your school. I can't play anywhere else. This thing is, is a binding agreement between me and you where I can't play anywhere else in Division One or Division Two. Now, Division Three has a different document. They call it a celebratory signing letter, okay? It's basically a piece of paper that's from the school that says that you have committed to this school and that you want to go to the school. It is not binding, but again, if you commit to a school, you need to follow through. But it's just a piece of paper. Both of them are pieces of paper for signing day. We're gonna talk about signing day in the last chapter of the last unit. But these are the words that we're going to talk a lot about as we start going Division One, Division Two, II, Division Three, NAIA, and NGACAA. So hopefully you've gotten all your vocabulary words. I hope that I haven't talked too fast through it, but I wanted to get them all in before you fell asleep. Take a word, take a look at all those words, take a look at all those definitions, go back to them if you have a question, mark where they are, write them down, and then you can use it. I'm gonna go ahead and make this a printable copy so you can print it out as well, all of the slides that were over there. Oh, you can print it out and then you can follow along with it. I hope that you take a lot of interest in the next couple of things. Let's find out where your level is. Once you find your level, I'm gonna tell you more about your division, what a normal day is like, 
their recruiting calendar and all those other things coming up. Division one is first, so get excited. We'll see you in just a bit. Thanks and God bless.